I would like, first of all, to thank organizers for organizing this very nice event and having me here. So the title of my talk you see here, in principle, I'm going to continue the previous topic, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, quantum networks, but in a very particular and somewhat uh, unusual range of microwave signals. In principle, propagating microwaves are very familiar to all of us because this is the basis for our classical communication or distributed computing or sensing among multitude of our classical applications. But of course, we also know that from quantum mechanics, nothing prohibits us to, in principle, apply quantization rules to the microwave, propagating microwave signals, and use their quantum properties such as superposition, entanglement, or no cloning theorems, among many other features, in order to form the basis for uh, quantum internet or scalable quantum computing, cryptography, sensing, all while being in the microwave range. And uh, in order to explain you why we are particularly interested in a microwave range, because sometimes it's not the most common frequency range, I would like to highlight the recent progress, uh, which is quite evident, for example, due to the talk of Stefan Philipp earlier this morning in the field of superconducting qubits. At WMI, we have been pioneering this particular field since, I think, good 20 years. Uh, and this is, for example, one of the particular flux, uh, flux qubits in the gradiometric designs where this crosses mark the so-called Joson junctions. And this is the picture of such kind of nanometer uh, tunnel barrier between two layers of superconductors which form this tunable nonlinearity and allows to create a quantum two-level system uh, with superconductors. Nowadays, the same technology is being expanded by commercial companies such as IBM, and this is the photo I stole from one of their recent uh, publications where you see you here uh, five transmon qubits, and then in more recent papers, they create the so-called heavy hex pattern here with up to 65 qubits, which we extend then to uh, 200, uh, sorry, 127 qubits in order to scale up uh, and build larger and larger quantum computers. The important thing for us in this context is that all of those uh, superconducting circuits and qubits, they operate at the microwave frequency range, which means somewhere between 1 to 10 gigahertz, and 5 gigahertz is a good uh, carrier frequency for many applications. Then it is actually quite useful to look at certain roadmaps, such as, for example, IBA quantum roadmap, and see how these scaling efforts are going. And they are, in principle, quite successful. IBM, for example, a couple of years ago reached their milestones of around 127 qubits. And then already, when you look at their fridges, you see that although those chips themselves are relatively small, but you need a humongous amounts of wires and various passive microwave components. For example, these are the uh, typical circulators, which are required to operate the qubits, just to control this chip. This is why if you look at a more extended development roadmap and see that actually a go to go, for example, it enrich the important milestone of 1,000 qubits, you need some incredible efforts in cryogenics, and this is basically the recent system, which we call the Project GoldenEye, where we are building a humongous cryostar, dilution fridge, which has seven pound weights. It's basically not even a car. It's something like a small truck already, which still nevertheless reaches the base temperature of around 25 millikelvin. It's a cooling power of 10 milliwatt and uh, has the experimental volume of almost two cubic meters. And this is all uh, required in order to fulfill this milestone and to demonstrate a NISC uh, quantum computer with around 1,000 qubits. And at the same time, we also understand that extending these cryogenic systems to larger and larger fridges, which is, this is the path of nowhere, we, at the end, and then IBM, we already started to plan to create links and start basically linking those smaller chips uh, by using some kind of quantum communication in the microwave or maybe other frequency ranges in order to reach useful near-term quantum advantage or supremacy. And these are basically these steps. And this is all needed in order to reach the scaling to tens or hundreds of qubits and eventually millions of qubits, as was also pointed out today during some talks or yesterday during Stefan's Flubert talk. This is what we need in order actually to solve some practically relevant tasks. This is also, in principle, not only the opinion of IBM. You can basically see lots of recent publications in this area where people discuss how to interconnect superconducting quantum processors, how to build those multi-node uh, microwave networks, etc. 
Of course, the idea is that such kind of networks would form relatively local, quantum local area networks, and long distance communications probably will have to be carried out at optical frequencies, although there might be still some room even for the microwave uh, medium distance communication. Effectively, that this is the task of distributing entanglement and having microwave quantum networks, uh, in my opinion, in the opinion of many other people from these papers, authors of these papers, becomes important for scaling up the superconducting quantum computers. Effectively, uh, this is one particular reason, but not the only one, because from fundamental point of view, microwaves offer also some very new physics. For example, one can also uh, look at the recent experiments uh, from Andreas Valraff group, who built such a kind of cryolink over 30 meters, and that was also the MCQST talk, I believe, a couple of weeks ago from him uh, in the vicinity of Munich, where you can use such system for some enhanced bell measurements in the um, non-locality measurements in some unusual uh, parameter regime. You can also then show that uh, uh, when having microwave quantum system, it also enables to study some fundamental novel regimes, such as ultra-strong coupling, many body localizations, as for example highlighted in these papers. This is also was the research we did at WMI, or more than a decade around. So there is a lot of fundamental and application potential. This is the message which I would like to convey here. Other than that, there are still even other, more fundamental arguments related to the properties of our atmosphere. Such if you look at these atmospheric transparency windows, you can notice that optical frequencies are actually not that great in relation to their free propagation losses because these are uh, usually on the order of 0.2 dB per kilometer. And at the same time, if you try to work in optics with optical signals through open air, you know that those propagation losses are extremely strongly affected detrimentally by any weather imperfections while microwave frequencies actually have losses by one or two order of magnitude smaller, and at the same time they are very weakly, uh, very weakly affected by rain or fog. In principle, that's the reason why all co uh, classical communication, our smartphones rather rely on this frequency range and not on that one. The problem nevertheless here is of course that the number of thermal uh, photons here is relatively large. Here we have a population which is in principle negligible, uh, and here we have usually more than 1,000 noise photons per mode. So we need basically to learn how to deal with this basically bright thermal background in order to uncover the open air microwave QQD and communication potential. This is basically what we started doing already more than five years ago, and I think QMIX project, which stands for quantum communication and sensing, was one of our first attempts. We actually have planned to have two dilution refrigerators connected to each other, where we want to distribute or teleport states between uh, two different fridges, and this project now in principle formally finished, but we are still developing and upgrading the system further, and this is what something I'm going to talk uh, today a bit later. In principle, our task is to create a couple of nodes, preferably several, and learn how can we create entanglement and how we can use this entanglement for something good. One way to distribute entanglement between local uh, systems to generate it, so to say, and maybe even purify it, is to use the very well-known quantum state transfer protocol, which is in the microwave range, for example, has been uh, covered in these papers, which works in a very straightforward way. You have, in principle, two qubits, superconducting qubits, in uh, separate cavities, then you make one qubit emit a photon, in principle, by exciting it first, and then you make another qu a qubit catch this photon, and, of course, then entanglement will be established between these qubits if you do everything okay. This QST protocol, however, has a very known disadvantage that it's insecure in the sense that if some eavesdropper tries to extract this information, she or he will do it easily, and then it's very susceptible to transmission losses. This is why when thinking about how we can create some extended uh, basically microwave quantum networks. We are thinking about better ways, how to distribute entanglement and maybe how to make it more secure. Uh, because kind of maybe for physicists, this basically security criterion is not very important, but if you talk, for example, to the German uh, security agencies like the BSI, those people are already worried about security concerns inside of future quantum supercomputers. 
So when basically he, uh, while having this picture in mind, we started to think what, how would it look in reality, and this is something what you can kind of roughly sketch, having kind of quantum nodes connected by microwave links. Then you can make some simplifications for technical reasons and not have this a completely uniform plaquette, but rather use some central nodes for so-called cold nodes, which wouldn't have any quantum uh, systems just to support the thermal load on these systems. And then the idea, our idea, and this is what we have been built basically at WMI, was the implementation of a basic element of such kind of network, which is a kind of uh, connection between two dilution fridges via central node, and which is designed in such a way, in collaboration with Oxford instruments, that it's relatively easy to scale it to four quantum nodes and beyond, because that basically just means you buy more such kind of fridges, more such kind of commercially available components and kind of stuck. It's just a question of space and money and efforts, of course. This is basically the system which uh, we have been testing extensively in our uh, institute for the last two years, and that was a huge joint effort. In particular, I would like to highlight these three gentlemen, which the students at WMI, Simon, William, and Michael, who are working hard to make this system a reality. And this is how uh, one of the most crucial elements of the system looks like, where you have the connection at the millikelvin stage level. This is this basically bright copper. It, has, it will have a temperature of roughly 50 millikelvin when the system is closed and operational. And the side of it, you have long coaxial uh, commercially available superconducting cables, which are then will serve kind of to transfer entanglement between these two fridges. This is how the system looks when it's closed in operation, and this is basically how the opposite side of the fridge looks. In principle, then, we can use our knowledge on propagating squeezed microwaves in order to enable uh, quantum communication applications in this system. So before I will talk about this, some particular uh, protocols, I would like to quickly remind you kind of what is my language, what is my codebook when talking about these systems. We all know when we have a propagating field that we can describe it by such kind of classical relationship, which kind of is related to magnetic and electrical field component. But since quantization of phase is always problematic in quantum mechanics, we prefer the language of quadratures, which can be easily quantized. And then due to the fact that the corresponding operators do not commute, it means that even in the noiseless quantum case, we always have quantum fluctuations corresponding to such uh, some kind of mold, propagating mold. And the interesting thing, uh, if you squeeze with basically vacuum flotations in one direction, and so that you have to anti-squeeze them according to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation in NAVA, it will uh, correspond to some kind of propagating microwave quantum signal, which will carry some highly non-classical properties. This is, in principle, a textbook information, which I simply would like to remind to everyone. We generate such kind of states uh, routinely nowadays by using so-called superconducting Joseon parametric amplifiers, which are nothing else but just tunable resonators. And tunability is achieved by using Joseon junctions in uh, superconducting rings. So when we apply magnetic field through basically this ring with two Joseon junctions, it changes its inductance so that the frequency of the GPA changes as a function of applied magnetic flux and periodically. Then what we can do, since it's a tunable resonator sensitive to magnetic field, we apply a parametric drive and use this device effectively as a phase-sensitive amplifier. So if the vacuum fluctuations go in, they are phase-sensitively amplified at certain quadratures and then deamplified at another quadrature so that we can squeeze the incident fluctuations even below the fundamental quantum limit as shown by the experimental tomography, the Wigner function in the phase space covered by the quadratures P and Q. And this is basically how we generate our signals. In principle, there is a very well-known classical analog of the system, which is a child on a swing, but I don't have time to talk too much in detail about uh, these analogies. This is how this system looks like, such kind of chip, 2.5 by 5 millimeters. This is the area of the squid, which is basically shown here. So these are uh, two uh, nanometer or 100 nanometer size Joson junctions. Uh, which form the superconducting loop, the DC squid. And then you typically place your whole sample holder uh, below the superconducting coil. This is how it looks then. And then you cover it in a relatively big, uh, big aluminum box to protect from magnetic uh, field due to the superconducting properties of aluminum. Then you can do lots of interesting things for it. For example, you can show that if you take two GPAs, and make them squeeze orthogonal quadratures, let's say electro uh, magnetic field and electrical field, and then combine them at the uh, microwave symmetric beam splitter, you do obtain a very interesting result, but uh, then your outputs actually look classically, like classical thermal noise, 
nevertheless with strong non-local correlations between uh, non-local uh, field quadratures, for example, electrical field. And that's basically a conversion of local non-local uh, non-classicality into a non-local one, which in principle embodies the quantum entanglement, which can be understood by using the notation of the EPR states or two-mode squeeze states. In principle, this is how we generate our propagating two-mode squeeze states, which we can then use as a resource. Uh, then we can use such resource, and what are the famous protocols we can do it? Well, uh, in the wake of the Nobel Prize for Anton Zeilinger, this is quantum teleportation, and we did it a bit earlier when he received his Nobel Prize, but of course a bit later when he did his first experiments. Uh, so that's just our picture prepared by Chris, who is somewhere around. Um, and the idea of this experiment, which you just use as a benchmark, whether um, basically how good we can do in this realm, but in the micro frequencies, is shown here. So we generate our entanglement, as I just explained to you. We distribute it between two parties, which are initially not very far from each other, so that Alice can then uh, superimpose an unknown coherent state with the entangled resource, perform the bell detection, and send the classical information to Bob via the feedforward classical channel. So that the Bob then implements the local operation, or as I just learned today, some theoreticians call it the correction operation, in order to perform teleportation from here to there. So the state is getting destroyed here and then reappears here. And the overlap in the phase space between these two states defines the fidelity criterion, and if the fidelity is one, then everything is perfect. If it is less than 50%, that typically is known as the classical threshold, then you typically say quantum teleportation is worse uh, than just the classical protocol. So so you typically want fidelity to be larger than 50%. Then we have, in principle, quite a lot of technical details which have been published and described in this paper, and I think I don't have time to describe all of them in detail. It's just basically how the setup at the bottom of the dilution fridge look like, so five GPAs, or well, only four when they used. And we can do all the necessary parts, such as calibration of our two modes with states, the state tomography. We can basically show how fit forward looks. These details I do not describe here, just flash them, just to maybe uh, some awake some of your interest in this uh, area so that you can check this paper for details. But one of the important results is shown on this slide where you, I show you the Wigner tomography of an input state and then the teleported state. And if you then compare the overlap between these two blobs, you will find that this fidelity uh, of the process, of the teleportation process, already becomes roughly 60, 59 percent, which is better than the 50 percent which you obtain if you switch off entanglement and perform the so-called classical teleportation, or teleportation without a non-classical resource. We can also improve this fidelity teleportation by adjusting a little bit, for example, the number of photons we teleport and by adjusting the bell gain uh, measurement. And so that we can enter the so-called no cloning regime, where teleportation fixes one of the issues of the quantum state transfer because it becomes unconditionally secure due to the existence of the no cloning pairing. There are a couple of interesting details hidden here. Uh, uh, which are connected to the snow cloning threshold because it's strictly correct only for infinite Gaussian code books. Uh, but this may be also something I shouldn't discuss right now. But I would be interested to let you know more. The interesting part, which is a little bit more related to today's talk, uh, is that when we did the error budget analysis of these results, we fitted nicely on these results. We understood where from all these losses and uh, error uh, budgets come, we found out that in principle our theory model based on these results predicts us that in principle we could tolerate uh, up to extra one and a half dB of losses both in feed forward and quantum communication channels leading to the Bob party. And assuming the standard number of around 10 to minus 3 dB per meter, it tells us that we can extend our teleportation protocol to roughly one, one and a half kilometer. It just tells us basically what is the potential of the current technology with the current approach. And this number I maybe would ask to re uh, you to remember because it will be interesting uh, to compare to some later results at the end of my talk, this basically number. 
because then what we can actually start doing, we can just start, let's try to do teleportation across the link now. And that's what, where things become more interesting. This is the technical drawing of our link with lots of technical details, which are important for cryogenic engineers and maybe less important for us at the moment. The important part here is that we have his long uh, superconducting uh, cable, which is cooled to the temperatures of 100 millikelvin, or sometimes a bit above, sometimes a bit below. And we have a possibility to heat it up in the center which is actually quite interesting because what then we can do, we can basically try to distribute squeezing. Uh, uh, it's not really truly symmetric to mode squeezing, but with some residual squeezing correlations, but that's not very important. We can try to distribute squeezing and entanglement at the same time between these two fridges by effectively using this beam splitter and just sending a single uh, squeeze state to its input while another input is just in the vacuum. Um, Basically, the cartoon what shows to you what happens is shown here. Then one state goes out of this fridge, another state propagates through this roughly six and a half meter and goes through the bob fridge, and then at the same time we can hit this cable. What we know very well is that if you actually add to the any uh, EPR state more than one noise photon or sometimes half, you have the effect of sudden death of entanglement, which kills entanglement. However, even in this case, we don't really directly observe this effect. We heat our center to the temperatures of almost one Kelvin, which strictly speaking at the frequencies of 5 GHz corresponds to three or four noise photons, but entanglement, which is quantified by negativity, still survives because negativity is larger than zero and that means that those signals are inseparable and therefore entangled. And that was actually a very important effect for us, that basically it was a theoretic, uh, sorry, an experimental um, justification of fluctuation dissipation theorem, which tells you that even if your noise is large, but your system is almost lossless, the noise doesn't interact with your system. So they are decoupled, this is why entanglement is preserved. And technologically, it means kind of good news. It means that maybe millikelvin links are not needed. Maybe we can just operate at the temperature of 4 Kelvin. And I will show you some interesting results in this respect a bit later. But then what we did, we did just a full teleportation by first of all distributing these two modes squeeze between two fridges, inserting then some unknown coherent state in one fridge, which we called usually Alice, doing then the fit forward, which was sent also via this uh, called fit forward link to Bob, who did just a local displacement condition on that signal, and then some corresponding coherent signal was disappearing here and reappearing there. Then we can calculate the same fidelity. And here, uh, we, it was a little bit more difficult, but still we obtained fidelities roughly up to 65, uh, 65, 60, sorry, um, a little bit less than 60 percent, which means that we violated the classical uh, threshold, but then we didn't violate yet the asymptotic no cloning threshold. Although if you calculate uh, the proper no cloning threshold under the assumption of proper losses and noise, you will find out that that threshold is even low in that case, but this is some uh, details for the expert. In fact, basically the claim here that it works, and we are continuing to improve this uh, experiment, and one of the interesting observations which we made here by analyzing the potential of this protocol is that we can actually, according to our theory model, we can tolerate respectively more noise or larger temperatures of our entanglement, uh, of our feed forward uh, and entanglement distribution channels because of the simple fact that what actually quantum teleportation does, it actually just corrects for the losses and noise in the feed forward channel. So effectively, it is acts as a quantum error correction for these imperfections, and this is why it's also a very important and big improvement over the QST protocols. And in principle, when we put in numbers, we found out that we definitely should be able to tolerate the temperatures in the feed forward up to liquid nitrogen temperatures, like 77 Kelvin, or maybe with some effort even at the temperatures of room, uh, of room temperatures, 300 Kelvin. Although we would need them to adjust the squeezing and the coupling related to the local operation at Bob appropriately. This is the take home message from uh, this part. So while well, basically what was always the game we played in the lab with our fridges, we, as I was advertising in the beginning, we were also dreaming a little bit what we can do in the open air by just looking at this atmospheric absorption uh, windows. 
And in principle, we were thinking like how feasible, for example, such kind of quantum communication uh, scenario, which is highlighted here, where we don't have any Millikelvin link, but rather we create some squeeze states at the frequency of 5 GHz, and we try to send them directly through the open air environment and read out them. So we can have some fridges here for generation and read out of microwave quantum signals, but here we would otherwise consider open air scenario at somewhere around the frequency of 5 GHz. The good thing, of course, for us, which was exciting, is because this frequency range is exactly compatible with 5G and 6G networks, so we basically were thinking, can we secure them by the QKD physics? This is the work which we started with Florian Feskit already some years ago during his master topic, where we just took this relatively known quantum optics paper, which describes a very basic CVQKD protocol, which is based on squeezed and displaced states, and which, is, which are sent through the public channel and simply offers the analytical tools how to estimate the non-conditional security. And when we put all the numbers in, we found out that in principle such a protocol would be secure in open air uh, conditions at micro frequencies up to the distances of roughly 200 meters, which were already very exciting results. This is why, because we thought that oh, there is some potential. Maybe it's not kilometers, but this is definitely something uh, useful and compatible with 5G, which actually has the same distance requirement uh, between the base stations around 200 meters. This is why at some point I applied and received the MCQST seed funding to buy some FPGA device, which allowed us to kickstart these experimental activities, which now I can report to you. Of course, we decided not to go immediately into the open air environment, but rather do such kind of a simulation in the fridge, in the same way basically we can simulate the effects of noise and losses. So where we would use our GPS to create the key and code the classical sequence of numbers into the quantum key, and then we would send it through some, some basically like a short superconducting cable to which we can couple uh, an arbitrary amount of noise to simulate the effect of open air atmosphere. This is what we call EVE. And then we would have to do, of course, a single shot projective measurement, which was also an important part for us. And this is how kind of our setup looked like with two GPAs, the one which was producing squeezing, then this is the device, the asymmetric beam splitter, which was doing the displacement and key encoding, and that was the second GPA producing the single shot uh, quadrature measurement. The key for this protocol, which is important for me to be, uh, today, is that basically is this classical key is distributed according to the Gaussian distribution. Then, if you encode it into the random squeezed basis every time, then kind of the total average ensemble, which is basically then uh, is seen by if it always looks like thermal noise, just because you kind of overlap those. Uh, uh, randomly squeezed states, which are randomly squeezed according to a Gaussian distribution. So effectively it means that you don't provide the knowledge of your encoding basis to if, and this is the uh, source of indistinguishability of the CVQED protocol, which is the key for unconditional security. Other than that, we used the same devices as we used for quantum teleportation, so these were our universal building blocks. And this is a bit more technical paper, a technical picture describing the details of our setup, which maybe I don't have time to explain, but still show for the experts. The key here was that when we create our squeeze display states here, we were always coupling uh, sometimes weak, but sometimes strong noise generated by an uh, external Gaussian noise generator, which was simulating the effectively the strength of the if attack and the, the temperature of our noise environment. And then we were measuring the states and calculating how much mutual information is being passed from Alice to Bob, and how much mutual how much information were leaked from Alice to Eve. And but before doing that, what is typically people ask to show is basically the process tomography, which effectively can be measured once again by using fidelity, and you can basically measure the uh, Wigner function at Alice and compare it to what Bob has received. And then you typically see that, okay, fidelity drops as a number of noise photons which are here inserted and are coupled by if, which is understandable, but doesn't allow you really to see uh, by itself too much because this is maybe too trivial. What is more interesting is that by using our single shot measurement, we actually can measure the whole distribution of various symbols or keys which are encoded in our states. And the blue here is the distribution uh, which Alice had, which she uh, encoded in the quantum states, and red is what Bob has received and measured. 
And the important thing is that those solid lines, which are models, these are not the fits. These are the predictions of our uh, theoretical model, which has zero fit parameters, and the fact that they coincide quite well was uh, very important for us. The next step for us was key, uh, was to calculate how much mutual information is, is distributed between the parties. And here you used the differential entropy, uh, which is related, can be related essentially to the distribution of sigma b, which can be measured from this histogram, and sigma a, and corresponding to their covariances, which allows us to estimate how much information actually Alice and Bob uh, have shared by measuring, for example, the PQ quadrature or Q quadrature. Here we observe a very strong evidence for the micro single shot quadrature because we see a lot of information extracted from one quadrature and we see that in the mutual information corresponding to the measurement on the conjugate quadrature is effectively zero within the error bars, which was very important for us. Other than that, in order to understand whether basically this key protocol was secure or not, you have to compare this mutual information to the information which is leaked to Eve. And for that, we have to use the so-called Haleva information, which can be uh, calculated based on the full tomography of our protocol and using the von Neumann entropy, so effectively then the uh, graph uh, extracted from the experimental data looks like it is shown here. Then what you do, you subtract from this curve this curve, and you obtain this very nice curve, which tells you that indeed, up to a certain number of noise photons, you have the secret key rate transmitted by your micro FQKT. That was the first round of our protocol. We did lots of basically error analysis. We did the finite key analysis. But what was actually more interesting, we considered, uh, considered recently the second round, where we basically we kept the same amount of squeezing, but increased the anti-squeezing. So, Uh, so we used more classical noise, which allowed us to see that actually when using more noise in our uh, protocol, uh, actually increases the secret key as long as this noise is trusted. And that was very important for us for the last graph, and I'm almost finished, when we were trying to calculate the maximum secure distance as a function of the temperature. And we saw that actually uh, if we are in the, uh, in the cryogenic environment, the maximum secure communication distance is around one kilometer, which is nicely compatible with the teleportation results. But if you start increasing the temperature, this distance drastically drops to 42 meters, at liquid nitrogen temperatures, and then suddenly increases back. And that was because here, for these three points, I was considering the cable, the best superconducting cable losses of 10 to minus 3, while for this point, I considered the room temperature open air losses, which are 10 to minus 3 dB, but per kilometer, so which are three, three orders of magnitude better, and which is a very nice uh, kind of number, which is also competitive, um, which can be explained by our theory. Here, essentially, I arrive at the summary of my talk. I hope I convinced you that both microwave networks and QKD has some potential. We are now developing this approach further by trying to put these uh, states into spin memories and uh, develop what we call quantum tokens. Uh, there are also some interesting quantum sensing applications which uh, use the same technological basis, but I don't have time to talk about those, unfortunately. And at the end, I would like to thank the contribution of our WMI Superconducting Quantum uh, Group and to your end, you for your attention. Thank you, Kirill. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so maybe a very short question if, from the audience. Otherwise, uh, I encourage you to catch Kirill during the coffee breaks or a dinner and continue the discussions on this inspiring topic of quantum microwaves. Okay, then, then I suggest we just move on. Okay, Kirill? Mm -hmm. Good. And for the next speaker...